All right, we are live. Um, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our uh, live stream for the Erevan Collection Part 9. We had a little bit of a technical difficulty getting this live stream up and running, so we're going to give everyone a second to get over uh, to this live stream from the old live stream. So um, we're just going to hang tight for a second before we jump in. Like last time, we are each going to um, pick out our, our favorite uh, item from the sale. Um, I think these aren't necessarily the uh, most expensive, the rarest items in the sale, although in a couple of cases they are. Um, but these are basically just items that we we really liked. You know, we've had a lot of time to go through the sale, produce the catalog, market, advertise the sale, answer questions from, um, you know, from potential bidders. So it's been um, it's been a lot of fun for us to familiarize ourselves with uh, with these items. And again, we just want to um, we want to share them with you a little bit. So um, anything else you guys want to add? We've got a couple of people here. Um, and again, we're just going to wait another minute or two while people hopefully find their way to the uh, the correct uh, streaming link. Yeah, last time after we did this, when we did Prices Realized, we also uh, told you guys what the items we picked out went for uh, at auction. And that was fun and people enjoyed that. So we'll do that again. How was everyone's day? <laughs> <laughs> Do we want to kick off? This will be archived as well. I figure yeah, more people sure. will see yeah. it after the fact um, than um, than live. It'll actually... Do we want to talk a little bit about marketing as well? Real quick? Yeah. You Why should. don't you handle that, Alyssa? Okay. Sounds great. Um, so around the Erevan collection, we generally always do some press reach outs. We do that with all of our catalogs, but uh, these are really fun just because we have so many um, different towns and cities we can reach out to and say, hey, we've got a really important piece of postal history from where you're from. Uh, and so that's been great. We've gotten some great coverage all around the country. Uh, we got some really great co uh, coverage in Vermont. Charles went up and did an interview um, yeah, for so TV. Yeah, so we heard back from WCAX3, a news channel in Vermont. They asked if I'd be available uh, via Zoom for, for an interview. And I just so happened to be running up to Portland, Maine and, and New Hampshire um, last week. So I thought if I'm going to be in northern New England, I may as well, uh, you know, uh, swing by Burlington and, and appear in person. So uh, I was very happy to visit the WCAX studio in Burlington, had a great interview um, and the, the piece aired last Friday, which I thought was wonderful. They did a great job. Uh, their news crew went to the grave. It, it's a, to go back for a second, it is the only Pony Express envelope uh, that exists that was mailed to Vermont. So there's about 250 Pony Express envelopes total, only one of those going to the state of Vermont. And I wanted to bring it back to Vermont for the first time in uh, probably many decades. So uh, the news crew went to the grave of the recipient. They contacted the local um, Colchester Historical Society for some more background. They, they put together a wonderful piece. And I thought, uh, you know, if that was if that was it, I would have been very proud of, of what they did. But um, fast forward to Saturday morning, I got a call from a CNN reporter who uh, who they, they were picking up the story. They were so impressed by the television coverage that CNN wanted to put it on their website. And from there, it just uh, just went a bit crazy. Now, if you Google the words Pony Express, there's all these news stories from across the country talking about this uh, this one sort of unassuming cover. So I'm very proud of uh, of that coverage. It all started with Alyssa's press release, which uh, I think is, is just wonderful. And I, I think that more than anything, is just a great representation for philately. I mean, if, if the Pony Express can't get someone excited uh, about about postal history, I don't know what will, because the Pony Express is just one of these great, uh, you know, uh, great moments in American history that we can, uh, you know, trace the story of through the the scant pieces of mail that survived, the scant letters that are still around. So uh, yeah, that was that was sort of the highlight of last week. That was a lot of fun. And uh, we've gotten some other great coverage from news sites, uh, you know, across the country. And I uh, just want to, you know, tip my hat to both Allison and Alyssa for all they've done to uh, make this sale come to life. Yeah. So with well, that, shall we, get... shall we jump in? Yeah, let's get yeah. started. Who's going to go first? Oh, I'll go first. You're going to go first. Okay. I'll go first. <laughs> all right. So um, yeah, we all picked our favorite items. Um, this is one that uh, caught my eye. I picked lot 12, which is this right here. Um, which features this 90 cent stamp on cover and it is one of six, I believe. Um, I don't have the notes open in front of me. Um, what struck me about this, obviously it's really just visually quite stunning with um, the different 
close of stamps and the franking and just as a piece itself, it's in such great condition. But um, before we get to that, can I explain the postal history really quick? Go for it. Yeah. So the, the, the 90 cent uh, stamps got number 39 was one of the last of the 1850 uh, seven series to be issued. So it came out, I, I want to say right in 1950, I'm sorry, 1859, right before these stamps were demonetized at the start of the civil war, a new 90 cent stamp was issued. Um, in 1861. So this stamp had a very short lifespan and also very limited use. 90 cents was a ton of money in the late 1850s. Uh, and you basically had to be sending something to China. Yeah, uh, this is going to Shanghai. It's going to yeah. Shanghai. So you basically had to be some, sending something overweight and international. And these aren't letters that were typically saved. So the fact that this cover is a survivor of the six covers with the 90 cent um, uh, it's got number 39. This is the highest franking. I want to say it's a dollar. A dollar 60. It, what's 84 times two? 84 times two is a dollar 68. So, which is the highest franking of any of the, um, the 90 cent covers of this issue. So on its own, it is a stunning, stunning, incredible, um, highly franked cover from the, the, you know, late 1850s, early 1860s, 1860. 1860. So right before the demonetization of the issue. But Allison, why don't you explain what it was that caught your attention? What caught my attention? um, It comes with a certificate that notes that the 90 cent stamp is reperforated on all four sides, which is rarely something that you see um, on cover. (laughs) Regardless, Um, the story is uh, from the discoveries that a family um, was selling some family correspondence, um, had some collections themselves, but went into a stamp dealer, um, had two 90 cents on covers. And this one actually had, um, the perforations cut on fo- all four edges. Um, and the explanation that they gave was that at the time there was a Scott listing for a 90 cent in perforate, which, um, has since been realized to not actually exist. Um, there was an empty space in their album for a 90 cent in perforate. So they just trimmed it off of one that they took off of a cover. Um, and since then it has been reperforated and reattached to the cover to be sold in this way, um, which I think just really, it's such an interesting look into the history of stamp collecting itself and how patterns change. And that's obviously something that nobody would ever think to do today is soak off the stamp and cut the edges and just kind of how collectors patterns changed and, and how, um, pieces can go through these modifications over time that tell just as much about the stories of the collectors that held them as it does the stamps themselves. So I think, I think that's a really interesting um, component to it, which whether or not you see it as a pro or a con is (laughs) really up to you. But um, I think that's just uh, quite, quite interesting. Can I share Richard Searing's quote real quick? Because I think it's fantastic. So again, there was a Scott catalog listing for a stamp that never existed. and, And the great Richard Searing said in a Chronicle article, such is the price of ignorance in trying to fill an album space created for a proof that never should have been listed as a stamp. That's and I think that's nice great. Quote, it's an true. eloquent yeah, way of, <laughs> of talking about this. Such yeah. is the price of ignorance. But that's it's it just overall quite a stunning piece, and, and we're thrilled to be offering it. And it, it's it's just quite nice. We'll take one last look. Okay. Alyssa, well, right. you're next. Okay, sounds good. Uh, so I picked lot 54. Take it out of the, take it out of the sleeve. Let people oh, see it. Okay. Well, it's in two sleeves. So here we go. <laughs> um, I picked lot 54, which is the magic letter express. Um, it's a five cent magic letter express. Um, black on brown. Um, It's to Stoughton, Virginia, um, and it is from July of 1865. Um, It's it's endorsed by the Magic Letter Express. Um, The Magic Letter Express is a really interesting uh, private mail carrier company that was only in business June and July of 1865. And if we're all paying attention to our history, um, that's pretty close to when the Civil War ended um, in April of 1865, April 9th, right? Um, And so this was sent during the Reconstruction period, uh, which is kind of a chaotic time in our histories, um, in our country's history. Uh, So it's really interesting that uh, Maurice Evans ended up setting up a private mail service in Richmond during that time. 
Uh, he said in a broadside uh, advertisement, which is one of the examples of uh, the magic letter stamp we have, um, that uh, he set it up to um, like help people out in the community and make it easier to deliver mail during this kind of tough time in history. Um, and that's great, but it was definitely very illegal because carrier services were only supposed to be uh, carrying mail within the city limits, uh, but they carried mail far outside of the city limits. We have um, records of them uh, from the seven examples we have of the stamp uh, carrying mail like 140 miles outside of the city limit. Uh, so definitely breaking the law and it was probably shut down uh, by federal officials um, during the reconstruction period trying to uh, get mail delivery under control. Uh, and so I think it's a really interesting cover because I think we talk a lot about the Civil War, but I don't think we always talk a ton about the process of getting the country uh, put back together after the Civil War. And this is an interesting example of it. So, Excellent. Yeah. The reason I remember April 9th, just to go off tangent, off on a tangent for a second, April 9th of two, uh, 2015, I was a recent college graduate <laughs> who had nothing to do. Uh, so I decided to take a train ride across the country by myself for two weeks. And I timed it so that I could be in Appomattox, Virginia on <laughs> April 9th of 2015, the 150th anniversary of the Civil War. Uh, but here's the philatelic part. Jay Bagalki of Lynn Stamp News and Scott Catalog, uh, who I was just getting to know at that time, also informed me he planned on being in Appomattox, Virginia on April 9th, the 150th anniversary of the end of the Civil War. And he said, do you want to split a hotel in Lynchburg? And I said, I'm a broke college student, of course. Uh, I just couldn't believe that there was someone else crazy enough to travel all the way to Appomattox. Uh, there was a postage stamp issued that day, so I got my first day cover. And uh, that was sort of one of my initiations into the stamp world. That's when I realized that I'm going to be you know, stuck doing this for a very <laughs> long time, uh, for better or for worse. So, uh, so yeah, that's why April 9th is a nice. big game for me. I was, I was there for the 150th. Very cool. So. Oh, and there's a, there's only two five cents on cover, right? And Correct. this is one of them. So Correct. that's pretty cool. Excellent. Um, I'm going to follow up with my favorite item, which is another local post. Um, and I have not prepared, uh, as eloquent of notes as Alyssa. So, uh, I'm going to be a little bit more, a little bit more, um, uh, exactly. I'm going to, I'm going to play fast and loose. So this is a cover with a cook's dispatch stamp on it. That's the green stamp, uh, on this side, this over here is just an advertising label that reads cook's dispatch delivers letters, circulars, funeral notices, etc. within the city for one cent prepaid. So this is a cover, uh, Mr. Ari von Haub, who's, whose collection this is that we've been selling for the better part of the last four or five years, um, kept many of his items neatly mounted on exhibit pages or in albums. This is one that was stuck on a black stock card in a shoebox um, for as long as I had been visiting the collection. And I knew that Cook's dispatch stamps were rare. I never fully grasped how rare they were. Um, because they're so rare, they're not the sort of thing you have any familiarity with. Um, I did not know this was the only example tied by a little red straight line I Cook hand stamp. It is the only example of the Cook's uh, advertising label on cover. Um, Cook's operated in Baltimore in the early 1850s, around 1853. Um, but it was when I took this cover off of the stock card that I was really, really blown away. So I'm going to read it from the back. Uh, it says, I found this cover in April 1945 among the philatelic effects of the late President Franklin D. Roosevelt while appraising his stamp collection for probate at his Hyde Park home. It, all, it was probably a gift to him from a friend who found it in family correspondence, George B. Sloan. So Sloan being one of the greatest philatelists of the 20th century, one of the greatest experts and students of local posts, uh, was, was the one actually performing the appraisal for Franklin Roosevelt. And he came across this. He actually wrote a couple of newspaper articles about it. Um, uh, including a, a Baltimore Sun article in 1945. So this was a fairly big news story when it was discovered. Franklin Roosevelt did a lot to popularize stamp collecting, but was not necessarily a great United States postal historian by any means. He had, I think, one or two Pony Express covers, a couple of 
um, Confederate locals, but it, they were mainly things that were given to him. He wasn't going out and hunting down these things. So the fact that he had this incredible, uh, again, the unique tied example of the Cook's Dispatch post stamp, um, I, I think it's really incredible. I live up in Dutchess County, not far from Hyde Park. The fact that this was this was there uh, in, in 1945 amongst the late president's art, uh, effects, I think is amazing. Uh, the other thing I want to mention, though, so we sold this cover in 1946 uh, as part of the Franklin Roosevelt collection. And then it was sold once again at auction uh, by the great stamp dealer Y. Surin uh, in 1951. His stock was also sold by H.R. Harmer. So this cover since 1945 has appeared at auction twice, the Roosevelt collection and the Y. Surin collection in 1951, uh, both times by H.R. Harmer. We're the only auction house ever to have sold this cover. Uh, this is our third time in a row selling it. And I think that's really incredible when you can connect the dots of our own firm's history. Uh, I, I think that's what makes this even more special for me. Again, it's a great cover, a great Baltimore local post cover, uh, but it's got this personal connection to my, um, you know, my forefathers at H.R. Harmer. And I think that's really wonderful. So from George Sloan to, to Y. Surin to Franklin Roosevelt, all these great, um, you know, metaphorical fingerprints all over this cover uh, makes it my favorite item in the sale. And I hope that it finds a good home uh, in just eight days time. So oh. um Sorry. It's 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 creeping up on us. Um, it's the penultimate of the house sales. It is. This yeah. is this is part number nine. There will be a tenth part in uh, December, uh, and then a sale next year uh, of of sort of cleanup odds and ends that we've uncovered since we started this whole crazy process of selling the Aravon collection. There's also probably going to be a sale of fancy cancellations, uh, since that's one of the most popular uh, fields of collecting right now. We've got a whole bunch of fancy cancels uh, in the queue. Um, but yeah, this is the penultimate of the, um, exactly the main canonical Erevan sales. Did you mention the Western sales? Yeah. And we have a sale coming up in early July of Western postal history, also from the Erevan collection. I want to say three, 400 lots yeah. yeah, somewhere in that ballpark. That's going to um, be really fun. It's going to be fantastic. Lots of express companies, Wells Fargo, um, Adams Express Company, Langton's, you name it when it comes to express companies, um, territorial postmarks from uh, Arizona, New Mexico, Wyoming, Dakota, Oregon, Nevada, Nevada yeah. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, incredible, incredible territorial postmarks. Great San Francisco postal history, uh, going back to the you know uh, the opening of the Federal Post Office in uh, in 1849 through the local posts and forwarding agents and uh, other uh, mail handlers that existed in San Francisco. I think that catalog should be uh, one of the most significant sales of Western Express material. And, and Western postal history in recent years. So that's coming up early July. And maybe one of you guys remembers the date better than I do. It's the 6th. It's the 6th. I believe it's the 6th of, the of July. 6th of July. That's yeah. right. That's, that's correct. Right. So what else is on the agenda? A week from today, we have Canal Zone Stamps and Postal History featuring the Jim Crumpacker and Paul Ammons collections. Mm -hmm. Then we have Erevan next Wednesday. That's what we've been talking about. The uh, 6th of July, we have um, the Erevan Western Postal History Sale. The 7th of July, we have Van Coppersmith's collection of, collection of ship mail, which I just finished describing um, a couple of minutes ago. So <laughs> if I slur my words, that is why uh, I'm, I'm a bit um, uh, punch drunk on, <laughs> on ship mail right now. Um, and then coming up the week after that, we have a lot more postal history. Jim Milgram's um, advertised mail, Nancy Clark's Maine, uh, Mark Schwartz's Essex County, Massachusetts, uh, Graham Booth's Transatlantic Mail, uh, Richard Lomax's Florida Territorial Postal History, a whole bunch of great stuff coming up the following week. So between now and mid-July, we have thousands of incredible covers we're going to yeah, be selling. Yeah. Um, not a not a single off-cover stamp in sight in that period, I don't <laughs> think. Uh, it don't is think exclusively so. postal history, uh, but a really fun and exciting time for uh, for H.R. Harmer. So it's all all good stuff we've got in the pipeline. A couple of We're other consignments. Yeah, a couple of longer-term yeah. consignments we've got um, in-house as well. So just a, a very exciting time for all of us. Definitely. Very fun. So, Anybody uh, have any questions for us? For all we know, our here. sound may be off. That's uh, true. Uh, no, I know. I'm no, if anyone's got any questions, we'll, um, <laughs> we'll stick around for another minute or two. But otherwise, we are excited to... Um, to get back to auctioning uh, just a week from today. Yeah. Um, it's been a little while since our March auction and it's always good to be on that side of the gavel. So. Definitely. <laughs>
So, excellent. Well, if anyone has any questions, you can always reach us. Info at HR Harmer is our email. I am on Twitter at Charles L. Epting. We are on Facebook and Instagram as HR Harmer. And I think those are all the easiest ways to um, to reach us. So mm-hmm. we appreciate everyone who tuned in. Um, I hear you did an excellent stamp chat <laughs> with APS on the Aravon collection. I think uh, that commenter is mistaken. Um, <laughs> you did it. I think there was Excellent. a. I think there was a mediocre stamp chat. Yeah. Uh, the, no, I'm just joking. I think uh, you did okay. Scott, Scott, uh, Scott English from the APS uh, heard me give a talk about the Erevan collection of Western postal history at um, at Westpex and was kind enough to invite me to uh, give a, a similar talk to um, APS's newly revived stamp chat season two, which I'm very happy uh, is back off the ground. Mm -hmm. Uh, First one was with David Ball on Astro Philately, uh, and then myself with Western Postal History, uh, and I think some other great ones in the uh, the pipeline. So uh, I was very happy to um, to be able to give that talk um, online to APS. I will be heading down to Belfont tomorrow evening to give a talk at Summer Seminar on Thursday morning. So lots of great uh, collaboration uh, with with the APS right now, and always very supportive of everything they do. And Scott didn't even pay me to say that. <laughs> um, I wish he did. Um, <laughs> thank you, everyone, again for uh, for tuning in. We really appreciate it. We want to do more of these live streams. We'll get the technology to uh, to work a little bit smoother next time. Yeah. And uh, no, we just really appreciate all the support um, and. Wish everyone who's going to be bidding in our sales next week the best of luck. Hopefully there's something uh, something for you guys. So great. have a great night, everyone. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Thanks, Thanks guys.